Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Earth's Surface Science Conference Call. My name is Stacy, and I will be your coordinator for today. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. We will be conducting a question and answer session towards the end of this conference. If at any time during the call you require assistance, please press star zero, and a coordinator will be happy to assist you. I would now like to turn your presentation over to your host for today's call, Mr. John Duncan, Project Manager. Please proceed, sir. Thanks, Stacy, and welcome, everyone, to today's Cyber Seminar. It's the first of uh, a late spring semester series. We have with us today two distinguished guests, uh, Sue Brantley from Penn State and Chris Paula from NSAID. And they're going to be talking today about an integrated approach to Earth surface science. I just wanted to quickly uh, go through this for those of you who are new to this WebEx interface. You can uh, minimize and maximize the screen if you like, but most folks choose to be able to see who, who's there in the participants list as well as utilize the chat window. And you can change who you send messages to. Um, and because you're in a listen-only mode, until we get to Q&A at the conclusion of the presentations, you can uh, send messages privately to others or to everyone if you have a question that we can work into discussions in real time. If you have any problems, this presentation can be downloaded from the Kawasi website, www.kawasi.org. And you can find it by clicking on the Cyber Seminar link and the current page on the left there. If you have any other problems today in WebEx, you can send a chat message to me, to the host. And we're always looking to get feedback on this series. And that can be addressed to me at the email account, commmanager at kawazi.org. I just wanted to quickly point out another, our next two cyber seminars coming up. One is going to be next Friday, given by Peter Wilcock at Johns Hopkins and Jeff Marr at NSET, talking about Streamlab 06 which is a really exciting community virtual experiment, and they're going to be going through that next Friday. Then after that, on May 11th, which I believe is a Thursday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern, Paul Brooks from SARA and University of Arizona is going to be giving a talk on how SARA has a legacy product and perhaps a prototype environmental observatory for Quasi, Cleaner, and Neon to consider. And the complete schedule, calendar, links, and all that good stuff is on the Quasi website. At this point, I'd like to introduce today's guest. Dr. Susan Brantley is a professor in the Department of Geosciences at Penn State University. She received her PhD from Princeton and is currently the director of the Earth and Environmental System Institute and a champion of the Critical, Critical Zone Exploration Network, CZEN. Dr. Dr. Chris Paula is a professor of geology and geophysics at the University of Minnesota. He received his PhD from MIT and is currently the director of the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics, or NSAID. And Sue, I'm in the process of transferring this over to you. So you should have control. Okay. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Just fine. Okay. Well, uh, this is fun to, to be starting off this discussion, and uh, I appreciate the efforts of the Cooper and, and Jonathan to uh, help us put this together. I think the, I should tell you the background to how this talk uh, came together, and that is that uh, at a cyber infrastructure meeting at NSF uh, aimed at looking at cyber infrastructure for surface earth processes, Rick Cooper, Chris Pale, and I started talking about how CZEN, the community that I've been working with, and NSED, the national center that Chris has been spearheading on Quasi, had a lot in common in terms of goals and and hopes, really, for moving forward with uh, surface science, Earth surface science. And so we began a series of discussions uh, as to how to make uh, those kinds of movement forward happen. And that's uh, where this talk came from. And we began thinking about what, what is the overarching question that all of our communities are interested in. And, and our draft of that overarching question is, is what's shown on this slide here. How can we quantitatively predict the response of the Earth's surface environment to natural and human perturbation. And if you think about it, Quasi and, and uh, the group of people that have coalesced around NSAID and then the people in the Critical Zone Exploration Network that um, I've been talking to over uh, the last several years, we're all interested in this particular question. We're interested in how the Earth's surface responds to perturbation. So this particular talk, what Chris and I decided to do, 
is uh, talk a little bit about CZAN and NSAID, but CAS to talk overall uh, in, a, in a broader framework, um, and I'll tell you about that in the next slide. Let me just briefly tell you a little bit about CZAN and NSAID, and you'll hear a more about it as the talk goes on. CZAN is an NSF-funded organization of scientists from about 50 universities, um, and some of these are uh, actually outside of the U.S. Our overall purpose is to address questions related to about how rock becomes soil. That's in a simplistic way of phrasing it up. And we've been meeting over a number of years uh, from our various communities, and we represent all different disciplines, uh, to talk about problems in science and sort of the intellectual uh, excitement in this particular area and to talk about how we might move forward in this area. Uh, the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics, of which Chris is the, the center, is an NSF funded science and technology center. It's uh, most explicitly incorporating nine of institutions with 20 PIs that have a lot of interaction with, with other folks. And its purpose is to catalyze development of an integrated uh, predictive science for uh, Earth surface processes. And as you can see from those uh, two sort of blurbs, there's a lot of overlap here. And uh, for our listeners from Quasi, there's a lot of overlap with Quasi. So it makes a lot of sense to be thinking about how we might be moving forward. Um, I think everybody knows we need a predictive science of the Earth's surface, um, at least everybody in this audience. And uh, this Earth's surface um, is also sometimes called the critical zone. That was a phrase coined in an uh, NRC report. It is the environment that, that we live in. Um, it's certainly the arena for, for all life um, and uh, for human activity. And it seems uh, strange that we simply cannot quantitatively answer really even simple questions about how the surface responds to change. And this is becoming of more and more importance now um, as humans change the surface of the Earth so drastically and at such fast rates. Um, as our conversations have evolved, um, we've converged on uh, the conclusion that we're, we're hindered by disciplinary fragmentation. So each of us comes out of a, a sub-discipline, and we can talk to our discipline, but crossing, crossing disciplines is, is very difficult. There's also a tradition in surface earth processes of descriptive research, and uh, what we are very excited about is fostering a transition uh, which is already happening to some extent, but a transition from descriptive towards predictive research that incorporates many disciplines. So to do this, um, as I'm sure the audience knows, we need to work together across our disciplines. And so what we hope um, in these conversations that Rick and Chris and I have been having is, is that CZEN and NSEN and Quasi could actually help to uh, foster this process. Now, Rather than talk for the next 40 minutes about uh, uh, organizational entities and that sort of thing, we thought it would be more interesting to talk science. And so what we thought we would do in this talk is to focus on one example problem, and it's a big problem, that illustrates the need for this kind of cross-disciplinary earth surface research, and uh, then kind of show how at least CZEN and NSAID uh, have, have seen themselves fitting into this problem to sort of exemplify what we're talking about. And um, hopefully you'll see the big picture through this particular example. Now, I think it'll be more interesting because we're going to be talking science. The downside is that neither Chris nor I are particular experts in the carbon cycle. And so uh, we'll be talking about things uh, from, from our colleagues uh, often, and, and uh, hopefully we'll be summarizing them in ways that, that make some sense. So if we think about the, uh, the carbon cycle, Everyone is familiar with this curve. Uh, this, some people uh, call the big curve the hockey stick. And uh, what it shows you is atmospheric CO2 as a function of, of time. This is based on ice core data and then uh, measurements of the atmosphere here. So this characteristic hockey stick shape uh, shows, um, since the Industrial Revolution, how we have really changed the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, we really started cluing in to this with this data set here, which is uh, from this uh, blow-up of this region, which is from, from uh, uh, this is known as the Keeling curve, and it shows the CO2 cycling uh, due to CO2 um, seasonality um, and related to the northern and, and uh, southern hemisphere. Well, um, obviously we're, we're making a big impact on the atmosphere, 
And what we're going to try to talk about today, I'll talk a little bit about how the CO2 is impacting the oceans, but only very briefly I'll talk about the ocean reservoir. And we'll try to look at a little bit more is the surface uh, surfaces. Uh, now, as geologists, at least I'm a geologist, and many of us are geologists, uh, there's been a huge effort to look at carbon uh, uh, over geologic time. And this comes from a very interesting paper by Greg Metallic, or a chapter in a book in 2004, showing his reconstruction of atmospheric CO2 versus time all the way back to a billion years. And, and uh, there's just been a huge amount of effort on the part of geologists to, to, to look for uh, proxies for CO2 in the rock record, and then to try to understand the cyclicity of CO2 in the rock record. And um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with those efforts. I thought um, that we should continue to put this a little bit in geological context because although we're talking about short time frame CO2 changes um, in the last 100 years, uh, carbon has changed in the atmosphere over much longer time scales. And uh, again, we can look at the 10 to the 8 year time scale. Uh, this is uh, from a, a figure by Bob Berner um, where he has modeled carbon change over long time scales where these cyclicities are, are related to the Wilson cycle and, and uh, formation of continents and very long time scale processes including volcanism and release of CO2 and then uptake of CO2 by silicate weathering. On shorter time scales, the kind of this five year time scales, start to see periodicity related to um, the length of this cycle. Um, and, and again, you see the, um, the um, glaciation and deglaciation cycles, such as, such as shown here in the 10 to the 3 year time scales, and then back to our hockey stick, which, which is documenting how humans today are, are impacting um, the atmospheric carbon. Well, we know quite a bit of, about the carbon cycle, and we know, for example, the main reservoir, certainly the atmospheric CO2 reservoir, which which is responding the, the quickest, and that's where we've seen this signal first. Um, the ocean reservoir is listed here. There's certainly uh, dissolved inorganic carbon in the ocean. This is already starting to respond, and I'll show you some data in that respect. Uh, dissolved organic carbon, ocean biota, and then sediments and sedimentary rocks, which are the reservoirs sort of on a longer time scale that, that end up um, you know, in the marine system. On land, um, the point I'm going to be making throughout here is that the reservoirs on land, although we know what the reservoirs are, the, uh, the fluxes and the time scales are very, very poorly constrained. And so, whereas we've seen a signal in the atmosphere, we've seen a signal in the ocean, we're only starting to see signal in the soil, and, and yet uh, this is obviously a, a signal that we're going to have to understand. So on land, we're talking about dissolved organic carbon, we're talking about vegetation, talking about soil organic carbon, um, and then we're talking in a longer time scale sediments and sedimentary rocks. So again, just sort of emphasize this time scale um, issue. ARC exchange is, is very fast, and, and we're already starting to see a, a signal for this enhanced CO2 in the atmosphere. We're starting to see that in the ocean. Photosynthesis respiration decay also are quite fast. The CO2 that we're putting into the surface waters of the ocean now is starting to mix downward. Uh, the time scale of mixing in the ocean is about a thousand years, so the CO2 we're pumping in has not reached the, the deeper depth, but it's starting to move in that direction. And then these would be the long time scale um, reservoirs uh, that, that we would eventually see. Um, here and then here are some of the also longer time, term time scales, but I'm trying to focus up in here in the shorter time scale today. Well, if you look at the carbon cycle uh, from the whole global point of view and do the box model that I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, you can try to look at what is the flux of, of carbon uh, from fossil fuels shown here in units of petagrams uh, carbon per year, 10 to 15 grams carbon per year. This is known actually very, very well, the 5.4 petagrams carbon per year. And uh, since this is the perturbation, the flux, you can look at the response in terms of the atmosphere and then try to partition uh, uh, what the sinks are so that you can understand why we're seeing the changes that we're seeing. So here's one of the most up-to-date partitionings, and this is obviously done sort of with a broad brush. Here's our fossil fuel flux, 5.4 petagrams per year. The increase we're seeing in the atmosphere is only 3.3 petagrams per year. 
So this is that famous missing state, the difference between 5.4 and 3.3. And so uh, we, we uh, think that sink is going into the oceans and into the land. And so this is just the difference between the 5.4 and the 3.3. Um, if you look at uh, isotopic measurements using both carbon and oxygen, you can make an argument that allows you to partition this sink between oceanic uptake and uptake on land, and doing that um, according to a recent article by uh, Jorge Sarmiento and, and Gruber, uh, it would partition in this way. So here's the sink that we know, which is the difference here, and based on isotopes, we can partition it between the ocean at 1.9 petagrams uh, carbon per year and land at 0.2 petagrams carbon per year. On the other hand, if you look at your land terms and try to make estimate, estimates not as a, a difference and not based on the isotopic uh, uh, fraction, fractionation, but rather look at your terms and try to come up with estimates, uh, you get huge errors on your estimate. And so what the point is that I'm trying to make is that this term here is, is very, very poorly understood. Um, and you can see it, obviously, in this error estimate here. But um, if you even go into the terms one by one, you can see that we simply don't know what these land terms are. OK, so I said I'd show you some data showing how the ocean reservoir is responding. Again, this is from a recent paper by Sarmiento and Gruber, 2002. This is um, sort of a snapshot uh, of the ocean. So this is depth in the ocean from 0 to 5,000 meters. And this is uh, contoured or colored in anthropogenic carbon. So what they've done is They've looked at the enhanced carbon that's going into the oceans um, with some basically sophisticated statistics to uh, be able to plot for you in this contour plot uh, the CO2 that is dissolving into the surface ocean. And this is latitude across here. So what you're seeing is that the, the depth of CO2 in the surface ocean is, has of this anthropogenic CO2, in other words, this per perturbation of CO2 that's being pumped into the ocean is deeper in the North Atlantic, which is what you'd expect based on the thermal halo and circulation. So here is a very nice picture of how humans are perturbing the oceanic uh, reservoir. And I've also I've already shown you how we're perturbing um, the, the uh, atmosphere reservoir. And I think for most of the rest of the talk, I'll be talking to you about um, what we don't know about how we're perturbing this land reservoir. Uh, just first a summary of this oceanic response. The total capacity of the oceans for CO2, at least over short time scales, so, so um, 100, 100 you know, 10 to the 2-year uh, time, time scales, really depends primarily on solubility and, and chemical buffering capacity. And this is largely known. So we know the governing equations, we have conceptual models, we can, we can calculate this. The process of equilibration uh, throughout the whole ocean, as I've already mentioned, is going to occur over a thousand years due to slow surface deep oceanic circulation. But again, the rates of this circulation are relatively well understood. So the point being that our perturbation um, of the ocean is something that, that we can model right now and we have a relatively good handle on. What are the problems that remain? Well, modeling convective overturning, uh, certainly uh, threshold behavior. If if there was some way that we could stop the thermal haline convection or the um, uh, you know, North Atlantic deep water formation, uh, that kind of thing, we probably don't know how to predict at this time. So there, there are problems in, in our understanding there. Uh, some terms with respect to sea ice dynamics. And then on a little longer time scale, modeling the biological carbon cycle um, is still difficult for us to do. But overall, I think uh, our understanding of ocean response is relatively good, uh, especially on the time scales we're interested in um, in terms of humans. I just like this plot from a, a recent publication, 2006, that actually shows you this is pH from 7.8 to 8.3 of the ocean, showing how the pH of the ocean is dropping already uh, slightly and then would be predicted to drop forward in time as the dissolved CO2 goes up in time and then CO2 is plotted over here. So again, the, the point of the ocean reservoir is we are pumping in CO2. Um, we can predict some of this, and we're in relatively good shape in terms of our understanding. All right, let's segue now to the land response. What's going to happen on land? Well, here's the, the present day thinking. Fertilization of biomass by CO2 should happen. 
Uh, what does this mean? It means the plants grow faster in, in higher CO2, and so carbon is sequestered faster as biomass. As nitrogen is released from fossil fuels and as we enhance the use of fertilizers, this also increases biomass. And so increasing biomass takes up CO2 uh, from the atmosphere. Land use changes can go either way. Um, certainly reforestation, like what happens in the northeastern U.S., taking up carbon. Deforestation is, is releasing carbon. And so land use changes can have a big impact. Soil carbon uptake and soil carbon release is obviously going to happen. Um, there have been laboratory experiments that show it's happening, and I'll show you a little bit of data suggesting that it's already happening. But really, we know very little about that, this, and this is one of the points I'm trying to make. So what are the main problems? Well, what are the contributions from each mechanism? We can't even really estimate that. How can fertilization and land use change be modeled? Um, how, can, how can they be understood and modeled? What controls the response of soil carbon? This is a very big question. And in distinction to the ocean reservoir problem, I really want to emphasize that we need data, um, and, 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 and data that's either time course data or very uh, well chosen experimental data uh, that can help us make predictions. We also need conceptual models. I mean, we don't have simple models like how much CO2 can we dissolve into seawater. Um, we, need to, we need to have a model to predict um, the soil carbon changes. And then we need equations. We, we, we can't just look some concepts and conceptual models. We have to have the equations to, to predict the land response. I think it's interesting to think about the land data set. You'd think that our data sets would be really good for the land, but that's not really true. This is just a compilation that we made here at Penn State of uh, different data sets for, for carbon in the atmosphere, ocean, and uh, soil, and biota over different time scales. And the only point I really wanted to make here was that on these sort of shorter time scales, um, there are land use data, there are soil data, but it's very difficult to find the kind of time course data that you need to make good predictions. So although you might expect the data would be good on land, um, it's actually very poor. And one of the main reasons for this is that the land surface is so heterogeneous. And you can contrast that to the oceans, which, although they are not completely well mixed, are much better mixed uh, than the land surface, if you will. All right, just a couple, couple plots to show land use. This is an interesting paper published way back in 1982 by Houghton et al., where he looked at uh, some land use data from about uh, 1960 to 1980. I, I, this isn't coming through very well on my screen, so I apologize if you can't see it very well. But what he tried to do was look at agriculture, forest, uh, grazing, and look at data sets for land use and, and then try to change uh, you know, the data that he had over land use change, change that into fluxes of carbon to make some kind of prediction. And you can see uh, what his conclusions were in 1983. This shows fossil fuel uh, flux of carbon. And then this is what uh, he was uh, suggesting was occurring over this time frame, um, from, uh, over this time frame uh, based on the 1983 data that he had. If you look at the paper, however, a lot of his land use change was based on assumptions and, and uh, models. It wasn't based on real land use data. And if you really wanted to do this on a global basis and look at land use on a global basis, you have an extreme problem of finding land use change data to make these kinds of calculations globally. Probably the place where we have some of the best data is in, in North America and in the U.S. And so you can make some of these land use change uh, compilations for the United States. And that's what's shown here, again, from the Samiento and Gruber paper in 2002. So from 1700 to 1920 to 1990, you can look either at land use change, as shown here, the different colors from primary growth back in the 1700s uh, to the growth of cropland and pasture land um, as you come forward in time. And then uh, some, some uh, calculations of the total carbon and how it probably has changed in response to this land use change. Um, and you can see that. Uh, there's uh, both uh, decreases, there's, uh, there's, there's increases in, in uh, soil carbon uh, in, in, in the Northeast. But my point of this slide is, is to emphasize that this kind of land use data is, is very hard to come by, um, except in certain parts of the world, uh, such, such as the U.S. 
Then uh, this is a data set to show you how soil carbon has changed. And uh, this is a really interesting paper published uh, just last year, Bellamy et al. in Science. This is for the UK and Wales. So this is the UK and Wales here. This is the, uh, what they did was compare uh, soil carbon data for uh, soil inventories that have been taken repeatedly since um, 1978. So they, they had a soil inventory in 1978, and then they had gone back to many of the same soils periodically uh, from 78 to 2003. And from the data, and this is just from the upper 15 centimeters, I believe, of the soil, they were able to, to compare what they saw coming forward in time with what was present uh, in the soil in 1978 and calculate a rate of change across the UK and, the, and Wales. And what you can see is their overall conclusion was that there is um, loss of soil carbon um, over this time frame. And uh, one of the uh, points that they made that I thought was really interesting is that they said that for this large of a geographic area, this is one of the only places in the world where this kind of data has been collected. In other words, there are many soil uh, inventories that have been made over the world, but soil inventories where uh, scientists have gone back and collected the data so that there's a time course of data are very, very rare indeed. And so this may be one of the best data sets of this kind, although I'm sure there are others, uh, other people that are compiling such data sets now. Just a couple of points, more than twice um, the carbon in the atmosphere is held in soil, so this is in a very important reservoir. Um, the rate that is being lost here is at about 0.6% per year, so it's, it's significant. They also observed that the rate of loss increased with the organic carbon content of the soil. So as they looked at TD soils and, and the more organic rich soils, they saw um, a higher rate of loss. Um, and that could be a very serious concern. And then perhaps most interestingly, they said, they said that they went back and they looked at which of these sites can be, can be binned into different land use categories, and they observed that the rate of loss didn't depend on land use, and so they suggested that it depended on climate. But really, they, this is a guess. Um, there's no model for this. There's no, certainly no equations that they're, they're predicting how this happens. Another kind of data set like that. Uh, loss of carbon from peatlands. Um, again, this was uh, noticed in the UK, and uh, this is a particular data set from Reynolds and Center in 2001. This uh, shows the concentration, dissolved organic, con the dissolved organic carbon concentration in water draining peatlands in the UK, and they have many data sets that they just normalized so that they could plot them all together. And what they've shown statistically is that the release of dissolved organic carbon from these peatlands is increasing with time. They've been able to reproduce this in the uh, laboratory by taking pieces of the peat and heating them up in the laboratory slightly, and they can show that the DOC, um, that uh, the dissolved organic carbon in the water increases uh, with temperature, and that's what's shown here. So if this is true, and it may be related to the plot I showed in the last slide, what's causing this? Um, is it due to warming? Is it a simple effect of warming? Um, is this data due to increased river discharge? Because obviously climate effects um, affect hydrology. Is it due to shifting trends in seasonality? Or is it a, due to stimulation of the DOC output due to increased effects of CO2, so some kind of fertilization effect? Again, we, have no, we don't really have conceptual models, and we don't have the governing equations that we need. So all of these uh, graphs of understanding and lack of data uh, lead us to an inability to forward predict. And so just real quickly, I've shown some plots here. Uh, this is from the IPCC report in 2001. Changes over time predicted in the global net carbon uptake on land. And depending on what uh, code you use, and these, um, are, I think these are different uh, soil carbon codes, or not just soil carbon, but uh, land carbon, terrestrial carbon codes. You can either say that the land is going to be a sink or the land is going to be a source. So we don't even know the net effect, whether it's positive or negative. And again, this is shown, the same, the same idea is shown here. These are just two coupled carbon and climate models. This is the carbon inventory, so total uh, carbon uh, that we're pumping out uh, forward predicted up to about 20 or 
2,100. Uh, and depending on who runs the model, uh, you get a lot of it in the a lot of it in the atmosphere, uh, or you get less of it in the atmosphere because some amount of it is being taken up by the, by the land. So the land is either a source for carbon, which is shown here in yellow, or the land is a sink for carbon. So I, it's the same point I made in the last slide, namely that not only do we not understand much about this land uh, sink for carbon or source for carbon, we don't even know whether the effect, net effect will be positive or negative. So these are the kinds of processes we have to understand. I'm going to quickly go through this now. So uh, it's a challenge uh, that really relies on, uh, at least from my point of view, understanding a lot more about this terrestrial system. And we need data, we need conceptual models, and we need governing equations. From the point of view of the Critical Zone Exploration Network, the uh, people that I've been working with, uh, we've been pointing out that this is not a hydrologic problem, it's not a solid earth problem, it's not a biological problem. Rather, it's a problem that covers all these different disciplines and it crosses all these different scales. And so we've been arguing uh, that we need to find funding paradigms and ways of bringing people together to address these. And so that's what the Critical Zone Exploration Network is. It's a group of people to discuss these kinds of processes, uh, not just with respect to the carbon uh, cycle, but with other uh, problems as well. Uh, and it's also uh, a an idea to go forward of how we can address these kinds of questions. Uh, how does the critical zone impact uh, processes uh, in, the, in the atmosphere? How does it impact uh, ecosystems? How does it impact uh, the land surfaces? How does it impact um, and uh, control sustainability of water and soil resources. We've suggested that the tool that we need here is a, is a network of soil observatories that all biogeoscientists could use to investigate the soil zone. And this network would be open for all investigators that, that are working on all these different, working with all these different techniques. And we've put forward a, a schematic diagram uh, for a model for how this might look. Uh, it would be, as I've mentioned, a network of observatories. We think of these as short-term uh, observatories uh, where we, we, you could be studying, for example, um, along the environmental gradient of lithology. You'd be looking, for example, at soil organic carbon and how it's controlled by lithology. Or maybe you would look at soils that uh, comprise a chrono sequence. So you'd be looking at soil organic, organic carbon, for example, along um, an environmental gradient in time, the exposure age of the soil. Maybe you'd look at a, a disturbance gradient. So you'd look at the same lithology, same, uh, you know, hold as many variables as, as you can constant, but look at soils that were more and more disturbed, and you'd look at how those impacted uh, soil organic carbon, for example. This idea for a way to set up a, a network, we think has great utility in terms of answering the kinds of questions that earth surface scientists um, would like to address. Um, some of the sites, uh, the ones that are at the intersections here or the nodes, might be longer term instrumented sites. They might be sites that you would want to fund and, look and, and study for much longer periods of time. Others would be shorter term. Well, a piece of this challenge uh, is that there is fragmentary agency funding for this kind of research. Um, many of you know uh, NSF, the USDA, the EPA, NASA, DOE funds pieces of this kind of work. But I would suggest to you that there's a big fundamental uh, piece of science in the center which just simply isn't being addressed and it's very difficult to address in many ways because of the interdisciplinarity. And we think that the solution to this problem is for the scientific community to lead. And so that's what really this talk is all about and that's why uh, these three communities or centers have coalesced and um, are trying to work to bring the communities together in order to perhaps uh, move the agencies toward funding this area, which is so important to humans but also intellectually um, of great interest. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce again Chris Paola, who's going to talk uh, a little bit more specifically about um, some example of, of, of research in this sort of area. And then also talk about NSAID and his work there. So, Chris? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, 
move on to the next slide. I just want to um, introduce the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics and um, say hi to everyone. This is my first quasi cyber seminar, so I'm glad to be here. And uh, we're, I'll be talking a little bit about um, contributions to research contributions to carbon cycling from research being done within NSTED and by um, our friends. I want to reiterate a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, I want to reiterate how excited I am to be working with Sue and with Rick Hooper, who isn't here right now, uh, from Quasi on this um, grander dream that we all share. And also, um, I want to reiterate that I am about as far from an expert on carbon cycling as you could get, so I'm going to be presenting research with almost all other people. Um, but first, a little bit about NSAID. Uh, I won't dwell on this slide um, that says what NSAID's purpose is, catalyzed development of the integrated predictive science of the process of shaping the surface of the Earth that I believe um, is a common dream for many of us, and reiterate that our, uh, our common mantra here is that the surface is the environment. Um, NSAID is a science and technology center. It's been going for three and a half years. It has um, 19 uh, researchers, um, actually soon to be 20 at soon to be 10 institutions, and uh, the main thing is just to emphasize the research field that we span. NSAID is fully and absolutely committed to the kind of uh, transdisciplinary research that we, we um, I think, all agree is critical for solving problems like this. And you can see the fields listed on this slide, and I'm just going to keep going here. Um, we have our research is organized into six main initiatives. The bottom, bottom three are not research. Um, you can read what they all are. Uh, desktop watersheds is one on erosional systems that is about watershed response to change. Stream restoration is um, human manipulation of streams, um, and our target there is sustainable engineering, and subsurface architecture is uh, combining what we know about the surface with um, what's going on in the new surface and the long-term archive that we have there. So um, <clears throat> what, how can interdisciplinary research help understand carbon cycling? Uh, the examples that I'll be talking about are some work on landscape, microbes, plants, and climate, and how those come together. Um, uh, with an emphasis on uh, uh, the microbial part, seven budgets and floodplain storage, and the role that that plays in the, uh, the very important issue that Sue raised, which is our uncertainty about um, land, uh, the land part of the carbon cycle. And then finally, uh, very briefly, actually, the order of this is incorrect. I'll do landscape controls on photosynthesis second, not third. Uh, but the key idea here is these are just um, what Effie Fufu would call research bites in a way. They're small bits of research, but they illustrate the inherent multidisciplinarity of this problem, and I think also illustrate the power of what we can what we can do by working together. So the next slide is an illustration of um, microbial abundance in soil. This is on a ridge in Australia. This is an area that um, is not a primary NSAID site, but it's work that um, has uh, is ancillary to NSAID's um, research interests here. The um, <clears throat> the basic, one of the things that I've been excited to learn from Jill Banfield, who's our microbial geochemist in NSAID, is just how little we know about my, microbes, uh, their, their uh, diversity and their populations, um, and also, of course, how critical they are in weathering processes that um, would strongly mediate uh, most geochemical cycles and certainly the carbon cycle. So this one illustrates the extent to which um, position, topographic position and soil thickness influence microbial abundance um, going off the ridge crest. Um, I understand from Jill that this is, um, even though it's pretty basic, is one of the first data sets of this kind that's ever been collected. And this is work that she is doing jointly with Bill Dietrich, so it's a geomicrobiology and geomorphology um, collaboration. And so um, looking at a map of uh, chemical depletion and relating it to that microbial abundance, you can see that uh, chemical depletion as measured by the, um, this is a, basically a silica anomaly, uh, and the way to read this is that the redder it is, the hotter the color, the more um, depleted, geochemically depleted the soil is, so the, the greater the intensity of weathering. And you see this relatively simple pattern, um, the soil points shown in black, satellite points shown in white, indicating the, the joint effect of the microbial abundance that we just saw, and then that transport, which is indicated schematically by the white arrows. Uh, away from the ridge crest and also entrainment of material in from the bedrock. So um, a strong interplay of physical transport processes and geomicrobiology, in this case, to control the, uh, the weathering. So, moving along, 
Um, one of the other things that we are interested in, along with I think the broader research community, is predicting how the surface will respond to climate change. And of course, now thanks to efforts like um, the various climate models that have been developed, we actually have tools to predict how the climate may change. I want to um, let's grab a laser pointer here and indicate where NSAID's primary field site is here uh, in the coast, um, northern California, in the Eel River Basin system. You can see. Um, uh, diverse rainfall predictions, and we're not so much interested here in exactly what the prediction is as in the fact that we don't know how the surface will respond to it regardless of which direction it goes. So the kind of work we're doing to address this is indicated here. We have a, a meadow that um, Mary Power, uh, Blake Suttle, and Jill Banfield have been working on. Um, it's a series of irrigation experiments in which plots in the meadow are, uh, have uh, increases in rainfall. Um, and in this case, they're particularly focused on the seasonality of the increase, as you can see, um, with winter additions and spring additions. And uh, even just looking at, um, at plots, uh, I mean, literal physical plots of the ground, you can see that um, the added rainfall makes a big difference to the, um, uh, the, number, the, the amount of plants, the biomass of plants present. Um, you can see, compared to extended rainy season slide with control, um, the, the results for, for species abundance and richness, and by the way, this is all research that um, Blake Settle and Mary, Mary Power have done, uh, is um, much more ambiguous. You can see that if the addition takes place in the winter, which in effect amplifies the present um, high rainfall period, you uh, generally increase the abundance, but that if you um, sort of get out of phase and add the rainfall in the spring where it's not currently high, you actually decrease the, the species abundance. And um, these scenarios have ramifications for soil nitrogen, for plant tissue quality. Um, sorry, the axis isn't showing up on my, <coughs> my plot, but um, the left one should be soil nitrogen, and the right one is um, carbon nitrogen in the plant tissue. And uh, you can see, again, strong effects associated not just with whether the rainfall goes up or down, but how the seasonality, what the seasonality of the addition is. So. Um, what we're working on now, and again, Jill Banfield, Mary Power, and Blake Suttle are working together on this, so it's a combination of macroecology and uh, subsurface, that is soil um, mic microbiology, is looking at how those plant changes would interact with soil microbial communities. And so ultimately, the goal here is to try to predict um, how climate changes like this, again, honoring seasonality and paying attention to that, will influence the cycling of um, critical elements like carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So <clears throat> moving on to a somewhat different topic, this is a result that is extremely new. This is from um, Mary Power, uh, one of our ecologists, and then said, Nikki Hanzo, who is an engineer who works on biofluid interaction, and Tanya Warner, who's a grad student uh, with Nikki. This is on um, photosynthesis and respiration controlled by uh, a, a quantity that um, they have called the landscape Peclé number. And I won't go into detail on this. Um, you can see on the graph the, le the vertical axis is ratio of photosynthesis to respiration. Um, the right, the uh, horizontal axis is this Peclet number. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, they're a little like Reynolds numbers. It's defined as the stream velocity times the width of the stream locally divided by the molecular diffusivity of oxygen. Now, the point is that the data that underlie this, um, this regression analysis, the power law that you see, come not only from our field site in Northern California, but from Minnesota as well. These are environments that are extremely different in terms of nitri nitrate availability, climate, and so forth, um, substrate. And yet, uh, we think by applying a classic engineering technique of um, dimensional analysis, we seem to be able to obtain a collapse that would allow us, at least crudely, to predict the uh, photosynthesis or respiration in a stream um, on the basis of this single dimensionless ratio. And I should stress that both the stream velocity and the stream width are predictable, again, crudely, but um, from uh, landscape structure, hydrology, and geomorphology alone. So this kind of result allows us to make first, first pass predictions of, um, of um, critical quantities like the photosynthesis to respiration ratio on the basis of information that you can get essentially from just the top topographic LIDAR and rainfall data. So um, we are uh, certainly nowhere near um, where we want to be, but this is a first step in the direction of prediction that we're quite excited about. So 
moving along, um, I want to introduce Ross Alto. Uh, Ross is a um, young, um, I don't know what to call him, he's a combination of sedimentologist and geomorphologist, I guess, at the University of Washington. But he has gotten very interested in the interplay of sedimentation and carbon burial, and his field area is the Andean Floorland. So this is um, sediment being sourced from the Andes on the western margin of South America and then being deposited actually largely in this area here in the Floorland just in front. And Ross has um, teamed up with some geochemists at Washington to uh, look at the effect of that on uh, carbon. The, um, the flux of sediment in this area is generally well known. Um, the main thing to get out of the numbers that should have just appeared on your screen is that a large fraction of the sediment is retained in the Foreland Basin right up in here. Um, <clears throat> so the, the idea that Ross is pushing is that um, the, uh, the Amazon Foreland alone may make a significant contribution to uh, the global carbon budget. And this has to do not only with sedimentation, but if you look at hypothesis one, you can see that there's an erosion component that exposes um, fresh material through landsliding. And uh, this may be also tied to um, storm events as well as tectonic activity. There is um, a, a hypothesis, too, that has to do with mixing and deposition and the uptake of um, organic carbon by initially low organic carbon sediments, um, but interacting with the uh, highly productive floodplains of this area um, and absorbing the carbon and ultimately end ending up burying it in the, um, and that's hypothesis three, in the uh, Foreland Basin floodplain. And I want to stress that this is interior South America. We're not talking about the coast. The coast, at least for the Amazon, is not apparently a significant source of carbon. So Ross has um, done some numbers on this that you can see at the bottom and suggested that um, there may be, this may be a significant player in the global carbon budget. And again, the Amazon is the largest river in the world, but we are talking about just one river. So to try to give a little bit of perspective on whether there's just something uh, extremely anomalous about that. We'll turn to some work by Jess Walling, a colleague of ours in the Geography Department um, in Exeter in the UK, who has um, taken the lead in putting together um, sediment mass balances for uh, floodplains worldwide. And to reiterate a point that Sue made earlier, when you get this seems like data that there would be a superabundance of, um, the next picture is just a pretty picture of flood, um, but in fact there's very little data on it. To get floodplain deposition rates, we use um, classic geochemical uh, techniques like um, uh, bomb-related cesium-137 and um, lead-210, uh, both suitable for dating and uh, measuring sedimentation rates in relatively shallow core. And um, you can see in the next slide, which is a table from some of Jess's work, uh, the rivers are all small rivers in the UK. What I really want to draw your attention to is the right-hand column, which is this thing called the conveyance loss. This is the loss of sediment down the system due to deposition inside the, inside the fluvial system. So this is the retention of sediment in the fluvial system. And I want you to notice that the numbers here are typically in the range 30 to 50 percent. If we move to a larger delta, um, this is um, the uh, Odd River Delta in, um, in northern Russia. Uh, this is some work that um, gets col uh, collected from uh, some Russian workers. You see um, a, another, another example of a 40 percent conveyance loss. So, significant sediment storage in the fluvial part of the system. The, the, the message here is that the river is not just dumping sediment in the sea, it's extracting a lot of it. And the last table is one that includes um, one of the largest depositional rivers in the world, the Brahmaputra system. And again, if you look at the bottom middle column here where I'm circling, you can see the conveyance loss there, again, in the range of 30 and perhaps as much as 70 percent. So significant sediment extraction and Combining this with Ross' work, significant potential for carbon burial um, in this large uh, depositional river system. Okay, and then just to, to, to step back as far as possible, um, we can even bring in stratigraphic data um, in which we look at the long-term sediment mass balance in a stratigraphic system. So this is seismically imaged data. Um, this happens to be USGS data, but the oil companies have collected lots of this that allow us to estimate a very similar 30% sediment retention in the fluvial system in this buried um, offshore, in fact, planiform um, from off of Ireland, actually. So, um, <clears throat> so a consistent tendency to trap sediment in the fluvial system, and what, what isn't known now is if you add this up worldwide, 
um, using the kinds of techniques that Rolf is using in the Amazon, what, what would the effect of this net um, sediment extraction and burial be in terms of the carbon cycle? So I am going to stop. Uh, we're just about out of time, but I want to uh, close with a few thoughts. Um, Sue and I uh, picked this topic knowing that uh, neither one of us was an expert in it, um, so in a certain sense it's nice because it's a neutral ground for both of us. It's an example, but it's an important example, of the kind of problem for which transdisciplinary science of the Earth's surface is absolutely required. Um, I hope, if nothing else, the, talk, the, the, the pieces that I've talked about here convince you that we need to think on a very wide range of scales, from microbes to whole um, continental margins, and that um, the disciplines involved are all the disciplines that really work on the dynamics of the surface of the Earth. Um, the center that I'm involved with, NSEG, uh, hopes that we can contribute by providing concrete examples um, for all of us to draw on of the power of transdisciplinary surface process science. And certainly we are working to, to provide um, scientific contributions as well. But the key point is that NSAID, even though it's an FTC, is very small compared to the size of the problem that we're trying to solve. So a concerted effort on a much larger scale is required to develop the science we need to predict the fate of the Earth's surface environment, especially in the face of climate change and other human perturbations. Um, I'm very excited about the, the potential for the combination of CZEN, um, the network that Sue represents, Quasi, uh, which of course is hosting this, and NSAID um, for providing the core of an, of an organization that really could develop the science that we need on the scale required. So with that, I'll close. Thanks to everyone, and thanks in particular to Sue for um, taking the plunge with me here, and uh, to John for helping us set this up, and we'll um, find out how the question system works. Thanks. Well, thank you both very much. That was a, a great talk. Uh, Stacy, could you quickly go over the uh, instructions for questions? Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to withdraw your question, please press star 2. Questions will be taken and the order received. Please press star 1 to begin. Thanks. And for those of you out there that have any questions, you can also type one in the chat box. We'll get them there. There are no questions in the queue at this time, sir. Let's we'll start. Okay. Well, uh, Sue and Chris, let me start. Um, in your discussions with how uh, these three groups, communities, centers, et cetera, uh, could come together and tackle these widely transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary problems, um, were other specifics talked about in addition to carbon, or if carbon wasn't even discussed? Am I still on? Yep, I can hear you. I didn't know if I was still here or not. Um, well, actually, carbon we just chose as an example that we thought would speak to a lot of people. I, I think that... Um, you know, you could name any number of problems that would cut across um, all these different disciplines. So we didn't mean by any means to suggest that carbon was the only problem that we should be working on. Uh, and I'll, I'll jump in and, and agree strongly with Sue and also that, um, but it is a, it is a particularly nice example um, because it's one that if you just took it at face value, you might think, well, it's a geochemical problem and, and that's that, but it actually ties um, everything else in. For that matter, you could pick physical problems, like if uh, if climate changes and the rainfall in increases, will we get more or less sediment out of watersheds, which seems like it should be a physical hydrologic problem. Well, you can't answer that properly without bringing in the um, ecosystem that would respond strongly and the geochemistry that would be strongly linked to that. Absolutely. We do have a question from Hank Losher. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Um, yeah, actually, I got a couple of points. I don't know if they're questions or not, but um, the first point was that, um, uh, granted, we've got a lot of governing equations for the oceanic um, uh, transfer of carbon to to the to the ocean, um, but when we scale, uh, it, it's very unclear when we scale to larger areas um, in time and space in the oceanic up potential uptake. Um, and those those uncertainties in that flux um, equate to um, just about the same amount of or, or larger uncertainty that we'd have on terrestrial systems. 
Um, and, and so even though you were saying that we, we need to be working more in terrestrial systems because of all the spatial heterogeneity involved and, and whatnot, but at the same time, there's a lot more research that are focused on the terrestrial systems trying to come up with these un, um, uh, better estimates and, and reducing the uncertainties. So, But when we scale to the globe or to larger regions, the, the, un, the total uncertainties and the fluxes are probably about the same. And um, the second point um, I have about the isotopes in the Sarmiento uh, paper is that um, uh, you, you relied a lot on your talk on, uh, on that paper, and I, I don't really know if that's really widely accepted in the community. Um, just a few years ago, his last paper and other papers showed exactly the opposite, where um, the higher latitude forests uh, on, on terrestrial systems were the 1.9 uh, petagram per year sink. Um, so it flips back and forth, and um, that's not, you know, written in stone, so to speak. Um, the third point to have is that um, you had put up a, um, a sort of a, a round robin uh, slide about all the different interagencies and um, trying to get them more involved with carbon and whatnot. And um, uh, there are large interagency agreements to try to work on this, and, um, and I think there's a lot of program directors that are very um, well aware and, and um, tied into a lot of the issues that you have brought up. The question is how you coordinate them and to make more monies available for that kind of coordinating and, and large scaling efforts through time and space. Um, uh, and I think that's where the focus is, not to get a lot of these um, agencies on board. Um, obviously, we're all trying to get quality going also, but um, I think that's a key point. Um, and, and lastly, with the NSAID, um, I was really intrigued to hear about your Northern California uh, project. We've got a huge scaling project called ORCA that involves all of uh, uh, California and Oregon in, um, in uh, looking at the interactions between carbon and energy um, and scaling uh, using from uh, top-down approaches that are constrained and bottom-up approaches that are um, highly parameterized other models. Um, and so the, a lot of these efforts are already occurring um, to look at the relationship between carbon and energy at larger spatial and temporal, uh, and temporal scales. So um, uh, that's something that, that I, I was surprised to hear from, that you guys had. But that was it. Okay, so um, I think you made very good points. I mean, I, I think, I mean, your first point was that the, the air and the oceanic sink, even in the, uh, you know, the, the data that I showed, is very large and, and could be um, similar to the, the land sink. And so maybe I made the point too strong that this land, well, that our lack of understanding of the land sink or, or source is, is, is so important um, and that may be more important than the earth. Maybe I made that argument too strong, but I do think it's undeniable that, that our lack of understanding of, this, of, this, of the land or terrestrial processes is, is very large. Um, I think, you know, your point is well taken that a lot of these clusters and reservoirs, uh, you know, people are still under debate. And uh, that's why, you know, so many publications show multiple simulations or multiple sets of data. Uh, and I did, you are 100% correct, I did simplify and show one set um, that came from uh, Fernando's paper, and I'm sure those are, uh, you know, not always agreed upon. Um, let me see, so the second point I was going to, oh, about the funding agencies, uh, well, I certainly didn't say that the agencies aren't, I didn't mean to imply anyway, that the agencies aren't interested in this in this topic because I, I, I think they very much are, but the point that you made is, is is actually a piece of what I was trying to say, which is that there, there, there needs to be some coordination and, uh, you know, if there could be such coordination, then I think the scientists involved are ready to move together in, in, in transdisciplinary groupings to, to make progress. But to make that kind of progress often requires uh, funding that lasts for periods of time and funding that brings large groups together. And, and that's what's very difficult to come by sometimes. But um, it sounds like that's kind of what you're thinking also. Mm -hmm. So I think those are good points. Yeah, and Hank, I don't believe we've ever met, um, but uh, I was very interested in your um, ORCA project uh, if you could email me or um, let me know how to get in touch with you, uh, I'd love to find out more about it and put you in touch with Bill Dietrich and Mary Power, who are um, heading up the uh, Eel River Basin project. I, we're 
our, our field site is 40 square kilometers. It's quite small. Um, so we're really focused on relatively small scale mechanistic approach. Um, luckily, we have um, people like Effie Spufula and Ignacio Rodriguez de Turbe with us who can help us with the upscaling, but working with a group uh, like yours apparently is that's interested in putting the scales together would be very exciting for us. Sure. Okay. Um, so there's a thanks from George A. And then Henry Lynn likes the idea of these three groups coming together. It matches the NRC concept of a critical zone. Um, and what is the next step for this joint effort? I'm going to see if you want to take that first, or you, Chris? Well, um, I could probably speak to it a bit in Rick's absence as well. But. Right. The, the three of us um, have been talking about this, and I think at least one of the most definitive next steps is we're planning to go down to NSF in June and, and talk to program officers in the surface earth um, within geosciences and talk about uh, a vision that might allow the three communities to work together um, in ways that hasn't always been possible in the past. And so we've been talking to the program officers down there and to our golf team. And uh, I think that in many ways the time is right for that kind of movement and that uh, you know, it may be an auspicious time to have these conversations. So I think that's, um, if I remember correctly, it's like June 5th or something that we will be going down there. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So that is that is the next step. We're going to be talking to um, Hard at Al about how to, how to get this organized. Okay, any other questions out there? So I've got it close to about ten, 10 after 4 by my clock. Um, Stacy, any last questions? Sir, there are no further questions in two. Okay, I guess... Just pause a quick second in case any of you have a last minute uh, concern. If you have any questions after this, feel free to email me and I can contact, you can put you in contact with Chris and Sue. But thank you all for joining and thank you very much, Chris and Sue, for doing this. I think it was a great talk, very interesting and a, a very nice example of how these communities can come together and work together. So thank you very much for your efforts. Thank you. Thanks to you both. It was fun. Yeah, it was. We'll do this again sometime. Absolutely. All right, and for all of the participants out there, the next one, next quasi-cyber seminar is on Streamlab 06, and that is next Friday afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. This concludes the presentation. You may now disconnect and have a good day.